Biodiversity Lecture, Part 5 of 5. Questions following the main lecture. Saving spaces, saving species, why is it important to you? Speaker Oliver Hillel, Program Officer, Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, held at John Abbott College, St. Anne de Bellevue, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, September 17, 2009, organized by Doris Miller, Nature Connection, which is a partner organization, to the Secretariat on Biological Diversity. These are questions. But I, I, I was going to tell you about a book by, David, uh, by a guy called Plumlee, called Natural Acts. And, and one of the things he discusses there is this thing with weeds, with invasive alien species. When we moved around, starting in the 1850s, people started going everywhere with steamboats, with planes, with everywhere. Australia is a case in point. Australia had some fauna and flora that was only found there that was because they were marsupials, meaning they would have those pouches like kangaroos. They were not as aggressively adapted to the environment because there, were no, there was no competition. So when we brought dogs, when we brought uh, uh, rabbits, when we brought all kinds of animals, goats, etc., etc., they, the other animals, rats, very important. We brought rats everywhere in the world. We are the ones who help rats. They are, they are our best friends from, from cosmic scale. They would exist if it was for us. Like fleas, like mosquitoes, those are our animals. So when we bring those things, very often they finish off an entire global ecosystem. Now a part of that is normal because, you know, some species do jump from one country to the other. And some of them are, as you see, aggressive and invasive and, and will cause that change. And some of it is natural. It's the rate through which it's happening that's become more important. And invasives are a major concern now, for, especially for islands. Because in islands, if you get an invasive species, you wouldn't believe how many million dollars in New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific people put into finishing off the rats. Because his point was basically, if we're not careful, we're going to have a planet for we, We're not going to be without biodiversity. It's just going to be, we're going to be with the biodiversity that we don't particularly like. Because for sure, mosquitoes, malaria mosquitoes have no chance of dying out so soon. But on the other hand, maybe a rare mosquito somewhere in the rainforest that doesn't bite us, that's the one that's going to go. Uh, from a scientific, from a scientific uh, point of view, you're absolutely right. All life is one, so you can take. It's really amazing to see how the ethical value of biodiversity is viewed. Now, so in that sense, I think uh, regardless of, of where you come from, from science or from religion, or from, we should. There, there's a whole dialogue between various religions going on these days on how to bring the, 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 the values of the diversity of life into the, the, the discussion, you know, because it's shared everywhere. But uh, on the practical sense, I think there is a clear way that we can do something. We have to basically change the way we do our own business. The, the way ahead is a conscience. And, and funnily enough, even though you can say, oh, there's so many problems, what do we do? I mean, I hear that all the time. Right? It's gone anywhere, so maybe the best way to do is to live the rest of our hundred years the best way we can, because it's going to go anywhere. But I don't think, and, and this is a denial of the fundamental power that we have to change things, you know? We have to consume less energy, we have to learn how to do that. We have to be mindful of biodiversity in every one of our, uh, of our as a consumer, every dollar that we spend can be spent a good way. I am the, the the guy that looks at those stupid labels and says, okay, is this biodiversity friendly? Is this environment friendly? And if I somehow can, I buy the one that is biodiversity friendly or environment friendly because I think I'm sending a message to the producer. So that's what we do too. We have to use more public transportation. We have to protect wetlands. We have to get engaged in projects like nature connections. And, and that's the way it will be. If we all do that, if we could do it, it would go so fast. I remember there was a phase in my hometown, Sao Paulo, in Brazil, when there was water shortage, because of climate change, partially. So all of a sudden, people had to spend 20% less on their energy bill. They had to spend 20% energy for six months. You know what? It was so easy. It was so possible. It was done like that. Why? Because the government at that time said, okay, whatever you, 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 you spent on energy up to now, you'll pay the usual price. Whatever you spend up, up, above
above that, you'll spend five times more, whatever. Guess what? People just found ways to do without 20% of our energy consumption. That's not a small amount. So I think if, if we could do that, you know, um, I can see how hotels are built. My, my area is tourism as well. There are ways to build a hotel nowadays in which you can have minimal impact really on the environment. You can literally, I, I see hotels where the wastewater runs through the reception over, over a, a, a nice display of plants, a kind of a terrarium, because by the time it comes back to the reception, it's as pure as it was when it came in. So I think the technology, and this is the other thing, just to finish, the technology is there, we have it. We just need to look out, we need to create incentives to use it. I mean, we're using oil now because many, many uh, years ago, maybe 150 years ago, politicians said, we want you to use oil, and therefore they put a lot of money to finish off the, the, the railways, they put a lot of money to finish off any potential alternatives so that we need to drive cars today. That was a political choice way back then. And if it was a political choice way back then, it can be a new political choice now not to do it. do something else, to build a metro, to build other ways to go bike. Bike is a wonderful exercise, it's quality of life as well. Yes, uh, my name is Dave Fletcher from the Green Coalition. Oliver, uh, one of the things that, that I noticed in the middle of all of this is that uh, humanity is on the horns of a very difficult dilemma. Uh, one is the control of our numbers and our growth. Uh, in nature, all the species that we talk about, uh, maybe up to 15 million species, have um, limiting factors uh, that prevent them from growing beyond uh, what's reasonable and what's healthy for the ecosystem. And the only species among all those 15 million that, that is successful numbers. How do we get past this? How do we return ourselves to um, a state where we're living within limiting factors uh, economically and technologically? Uh, uh, how, do, how do we get past that? Right. Well, first of all, thankfully, it's happening already. So um, one of the great consequences of urbanization, of living in cities, is actually that people have less kids. It's, it's a natural consequence of, of Social, social decisions as well. I, I live in Brazil, I've seen communities where you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten children, and others like urban communities where you have one, two, or maybe none. It's a question of choice. I think, um, and by the way, just as a biologist, I can tell you, when other populations are controlled, it's not easy either. A lot of people are dying as well. End of part five of five of the lecture on biological diversity, end of question period lecture given by Oliver Hillel.